Fantastic. Thank you so much. My name is Christina Ishmael, and I am the Director of Primary and Secondary Education for Open Ed Global. I will be the facilitator for this session. I am joined by my colleague and friend, Marcella, who is also going to be here helping with um, technology and as our tech facilitator. So if you do have um, questions or concerns, please, please feel free to um, ask those questions in the chat. Um, you can also direct message us through the chat if you if you would like to. Um, otherwise, we have nothing else to say because we're going to turn it over to our presenter, Byron, and hear more from him. So take it away, By Byron. Hi. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Just yell at me if, I, if you can't hear me. Um, start my presentation. So yeah, I'm joining you from Calgary, Alberta today. It's a little bit darker than I expected um, this morning, but uh, I was able to find a lamp to, to use for the presentation, so hopefully you can see me. Um, the title of my talk today is called The Importance of Ethics in Data Science. Students and teachers can learn the importance of being human through computational thinking. Um, what we'll be talking about today are some of the major human-centered ethical issues facing data science today. I'll give you a few examples and maybe talk about the good side and bad side of those things, um, why you should introduce data science in your classroom starting today. Hopefully you'll take that as a takeaway from today and also some data science resources to get you started as well. So I'm here representing the Callisto Project. The Callisto Project is a Canadian government funded CAN code project. And the mandate of the CAN code program is to provide our students and teachers with the skills to, to thrive in the digital future of tomorrow but which is probably actually quite relevant for today uh, with all the online learning going on these days. Uh, the organizations behind the Callisto project are actually two of them. So Cybera, which is the company I work for, it's a nonprofit IT accelerator based in Calgary, Alberta and Edmonton, Alberta, and the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, which is a group of Western Canadian math researchers at uh, Western Canadian math researchers um, who are like dedicated to research and education excellence in mathematics. Uh, a little bit about myself, I guess, before I jump into the, the talk today. Um, so I am a project manager and data scientist at Cybera. And my data science journey really didn't start by doing anything formal in data science. So I'm a, I guess I, I did grad school as a computational biochemist at the beginning. And I, I, the computational part kind of came after. So I, I am really like a wet, have a wet lab background doing biochemistry. Um, but then as I was doing sort of my grad school, um, I started collecting a lot of data and I, I would process it and analyze it and try to get results from it using maybe typical means like a spreadsheet. But I, I quickly realized that that was becoming unmanageable and I was having too much data to deal with. Uh, so I had to learn some te techniques to to make my life easier, basically. And so I started to learn a little bit of uh, scripting and computer programming, and that really helped me along. And then as I did more of my grad school studies, I ended up doing, I collected a lot more data and it involved sort of multi-dimensional techniques as well. So there's no way you can actually do that by hand. So I had to figure out a way to, to do that and process things and visualize things uh, using computer programming. and. Once I joined the professional ranks, um, I could continue to develop those skills and sort of ended up where I am today, um, but also realizing that I had to pick up all those skills on my own and there was no sort of formal education um, either in K to 12 or in university that I had taken or undergrad that I had taken that would have really like, uh, that could have prepared me for all the stuff I had to do in grad school and had to learn myself, pick up myself sort of um, on my own whim. So I thought, you know, taking those experiences and really wondering what we can do sort of for the at the K, for K to 12 folks was sort of what an inspiration behind this Callisto project as well. Um, so love for you to introduce yourselves. I know a lot of you have already said hi in the chat, but feel free to introduce yourself, um, what brought you to the talk today, things like that. Love to just connect with you a little bit uh, in kind of this virtual setting. Okay. So this is sort of the thesis for my talk today. So why are we scared of data science and AI? Now you may or may not be scared of data science and AI or artificial intelligence, um, but maybe we should consider uh, this statement. 
so the biggest data companies in the world have grown so quickly that no one has stopped to think about ethics. And in general, there should be awareness about releasing data scientists into industry with weapons that they don't yet know how to use. And that's from a UC Berkeley undergrad, a quote taken from a UC Berkeley undergrad. So that's something to think about. And I guess the concept of weapons um, is kind of interesting as well with respect to sort of software. And so uh, before we get into maybe why we should be scared of data science, I also want to share with you why I'm excited about data science and why I really got excited about data science. And so this is sort of some of the inspiration that kind of inspired me to, to really learn more about data science and develop some skills in this area. Oops, let's try that again. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistic that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The Imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. So the, the late Hans Rosling gave that talk and it, I think, inspired probably a generation of data scientists. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, hope behind data science as well, especially for things like uh, data-driven decision-making and, you know, data-informed policy-making, things like that. I think that's sort of the hope behind data science is really that we can use data uh, to do good and to make good decisions and make good policy. Um, so. I guess for my question to you folks is, you know, I've talked about maybe a fearful statement. I've shown you some inspiration around data science. What does data science in the term make you think of? Uh, feel free to add any comments you want in the chat there. Um, some context for me, when oftentimes we hear about data science in the media, we, we hear about companies like Amazon and their efforts with, you know, uh, their cloud services and their, and, and prime and anticip anticipatory shipping. So being able to maybe predict what you wanna buy and maybe ship you something before you even know you need it kind of thing. So that's one way to look at how you can use data science in the world today. Um, Google Analytics, so everything we do basically on the web, Google Analytics is, is really tracking us in, in some way and using that information to, again, maybe show us ads or selling that data to third parties and so, and you know, using that again to 
to try to sell us something. Um, Facebook, for example, like it started off being something where you can share a lot of information with friends, share how you're feeling, uh, share photos, and it turned into you know a lot of other things as well now. Um, and again, associated with Facebook is sort of that Cambridge Analytical Analytica scandal that happened a few years ago. So there's a lot of things that when you think about data science and you hear about it in the media, a, a lot of these things are tied to, to big companies. But other things maybe to think about when you think about data science is uh, careers and jobs. So when we think about school and students graduating from you know, high school and undergraduate, like the data science field is actually a pretty decent job. So this is from glassdoor.com. Of the 50 best jobs in America for 2020, data scientist is number three. You get a pretty decent median-based salary. Job satisfaction is pretty high. Large number of job openings, that's great. And if you look closely sort of at this top six list, you'll see a couple other things like uh, data engineer, product manager, and DevOps engineer on that list as well. And that can also be closely tied to the data science field as well. And the data science position was actually the top job in America, I think, from 2016 all the, or 2015 all the way to 2019 as well. So it's been up there and there's still quite a bit of demand for data science jobs in the world. So I think there's a lot of you know, career opportunities as well in this area as well. Okay, and maybe before we dive into the ethics side of it, so what is data science? So really data science is quite interdisciplinary by nature. Um, it's a means of gaining insights from data using a mix of math. So math and stats knowledge, computing, um, computing skills like programming skills. And in this Venn diagram, we consider that sort of like hacking skills, um, but it really means like computer uh, programming skills and subject matter knowledge or substantive expertise. And data science kind of fits right in the middle there. Uh, we talk about a danger zone. So if you have great computing skills and you have maybe subject matter expertise in some area, but you don't have those math and stats knowledge, um, a lot of the results you can get from you know, applying data science tools and techniques can lead you astray without sort of those, a sound sort of math and stats grounding as well. So. We think in order to have a well-rounded sort of data scientist, you need to be right smack dab in the middle or at least be surrounded by a team with uh, complementary skills to yourself that could allow you to, to really thrive as a data scientist. Okay, and so when I talk about data science, really um, I've described what a data scientist might look like, having those math skills, those programming skills, and maybe subject matter knowledge. How does data science fit in with artificial intelligence and machine learning? All buzzwords we hear about today. So generally speaking, AI is really the big field of study. So it's a blanket term describing our efforts to make computers think like humans, more or less. Um, within artificial intelligence, we have things like machine learning techniques and tools or algorithms um, that allow us to improve or learn through um, exposure to data or experience depending on what you wanna do. And data science isn't necessarily part of the, the research area, but in order to do data science, um, you wanna take and apply those techniques developed by the machine learning researchers and use those uh, with real world data to derive maybe uh, knowledge about business outcomes or policymaking, things like that. So that's really where data science kind of fits into the, uh, the overall picture as well. Um, if we wanted to dive in a little bit more, like what are the components of an AI system? Um, so again, understanding how an AI system generally works um, and how it can be used uh, with real life examples. So the three main components of an AI system, and this is just generally speaking, are, you know, you have to have data. So you have to have data um, that you can process. And then you need to have some type of learning algorithm, usually typically a machine learning algorithm uh, in the middle there. And then the output of the AI system is some type of prediction. And diving into these components a little bit more, uh, a data set um, is a collection of curated data. And that's really important. The curated word is, is really the important part here. Um, it includes images, uh, measurements, text, video recordings, pretty much anything can be turned into to a digital format and turned into data these days. So um, video, 
anything you, you can think of really um, can be turned into a data set that can be used to train um, an AI system. And now talking about that middle chunk, the machine learning algorithm. So what happens with an algorithm? Or, you know, what's the definition of an algorithm? So like you have some original state. So like maybe the input state, um, you add some new data. Uh, there are some steps in the middle that will change that state. And then you have your new state, which is sort of the output state. So like uh, those are the general sort of steps within that middle learning algorithm step or machine learning algorithm step. And finally, you have your prediction. So like there's various types of predictions. You may be trying to predict the weather for the next day, the results of the election. You may be trying to predict how groups can be separated into distinct clusters. Um, you might be trying to predict text. So you might be trying to predict your next word in a sentence. You might be trying to mimic how someone writes, for example, uh, with natural language processing. So you might be trying to predict what that might look like if they were to write um, a text about maybe a science fiction topic or something like that. So there's a lot of different things. Um, and so like, you know, all those things sound really great. Uh, what could go wrong really with all these things? Well, there's, there's a few things. Um, and we'll talk about a few examples today um, where that gets highlighted. So here are some headlines that you might, you might've come across. Um, online, for example, looking at media. So online ads for high paying jobs are targeting men more than women. Women, When it comes to policing, data is not benign. There's books about this topic, the ethical algorithm, uh, obviously Cambridge Analytica, which I mentioned before, Facebook, Amazon Prime. So all these companies that are applying data science and AI in our world today, uh, they face a lot of uh, conundrums as well associated with the application of of what they're doing with these AI systems. And one book I, I really enjoyed reading um, was called Ma Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. And this is one of the quotes that she has in there. Basically, you can sum it up by saying, algorithms are not neutral, they encode our biases. So um, in this case, these models are constructed not just from data, but the choices we make about which data to pay attention to and which to leave out. So again, the, the concept of curation. In it. Um, those choices are fundamentally moral. Um, if we back away from them and treat mathematical models as neutral and inevitable forces like the weather or the tides, we abdicate our responsibilities. So she really is talking about um, not just accepting the results of an AI algorithm, but actually questioning and, and making sure that you know we're in a lot of ways um, you know, pushing back on these AI algorithms a little bit and, and questioning them or, or policing them or making sure there are rules in place to, to keep them um, from just making decisions without uh, our direct input. Uh, so I'm gonna show you sort of another short clip here that um, about a project which I thought was really interesting um, and talks about some of these uh, issues that we commonly see in the media as related to sort of ethics and AI and, and data science. I'm Joy, and I research how computers detect, recognize, and classify people's faces. In my TED featured talk, I spoke about my experience with the coded gaze, my term for algorithmic bias. The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face, but when it came to detecting my face, it didn't do so well until I put on a white mask. After my talk was posted, I tested my speaker image profile across different facial analysis demos. Two of the demos didn't detect my face. The other two, well, they misgendered me. The demos didn't even distinguish between gender identity and biological sex. They just provided two labels, male and female. Now I wanted to see if these results were just because of my unique facial features or if this was something that was more of a pattern across other faces too. So I began a project that became my MIT thesis, Gender Shades, or the long title, Gender Shades, Intersectional Phenotypic and Demographic Evaluation of Face Data Sets and Gender Classifiers, or just Gender Shades. 
I wanted to see how well different gender classification systems worked across different people's faces and if the results changed based on somebody's gender or their skin type. I created a data set of over a thousand images of parliament members ranked among the top 10 in the world based on their representation of women in power. To get at a range of skin types, I chose three African countries and three European countries so I could see how the system performed on lighter skin and darker skin. Then I chose three companies to evaluate, IBM, Microsoft, and Face++, which has access to one of the largest data sets of Chinese faces. So now with the data set and the companies, I decided to run a test. The companies appear to have relatively high accuracy overall. Microsoft performed best, achieving 94% accuracy on the whole data set. All companies perform better on males than females, and all companies also perform better on lighter subjects than on darker subjects. When we analyzed the results by four subgroups, we saw that all companies performed worst on darker females. IBM and Microsoft perform best on lighter males, and Face++ perform best on darker males compared to the others. Okay, so as you heard in the video, Joy uh, created a new type of data set. Um, so it's a new facial image data set, which is highly balanced across skin phenotype and gender. So that's the, the gender shades uh, data set. Um, and as the result of this research, um, so IBM, for example, is developing algorithms for detecting, rating, and correcting bias and discrimination across modalities, both for data and for models. So uh, I think IBM was part of the, uh, an, an IBM algorithm was part of the sort of uh, things that Joy tested her, her data set against. So it's really interesting that, um, you know, these companies, even though they're really large and potentially intimidating, they'd actually respond to something like this where they, re they recognize they're, they're still, you know, their algorithms are still kind of a work in progress and uh, they want to be able to correct uh, and make and do better with that. So that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, but really, maybe something to think about as well is like, how will these better algorithms be used? Yes, facial recognition programs should improve, but um, there are also going to be commercial applications that come out of this that, um, you know, may, you might question as well. So a number of companies are considering um, using race classification as a way for businesses and to target buying habits of different gender groups so or of different groups so you may or may not question whether or not that's fair or not so that's something to think about at least and so there's more than one uh, example of this sort of happening as well so uh, we're creating better algorithms or we're trying to create better algorithms to remove some of that bias uh, but it also opens up other sort of questions as well um, another sort of example I'd like to talk about today is this Proctorio example, which is around sort of exam proctoring. And this has really come up as a result of, of COVID-19 as well, where um, a lot of universities and are, are really relying on this exam, pro like this remote exam proctoring software um, to uh, proctor their exams. And it relies on facial identification and tracking. So it runs into the same sort of uh, gender and uh, ethnicity um, issues that the gender shades example kind of identified as well. So it has some problems recognizing um, people of, of different skin tones. Um, it also has some other issues as well. So when you're set up using one of these exams, and I haven't actually done this myself, so I don't have firsthand knowledge, but from what I've read, um, it takes sort of like a widescreen angle of the room you're working in. Um, so there might be some privacy concerns of what's going on. Um, and there's also concerns associated with, you know, what it actually does to the individual taking the exam. So in addition to the stress associated with taking the exams, um, it can also cause additional stress because you don't know what behaviors you're doing may flag, uh, may cause a system or the AI system to flag you as uh, acting suspiciously or something. And so, um, maybe you try not to act suspicious while you're writing your exam on top of the additional stress of 
or the, the, the regular stress of actually writing the exam itself. So these uh, remote proctoring exam systems are kind of interesting. And uh, for one example of maybe some of the, the concerns associated with it, there's a, a proctorial uh, University of British Columbia lawsuit going on currently, I believe. And in that case, uh, one UBC uh, re, uh, instructor, I think, released or provided links to some of the training videos that Proctorio provides. And um, it shows some information about how Proctorio actually works. Uh, so some of their intellectual property in terms of like how their system works and they didn't want that information to be revealed. Um, so there's there's a lawsuit going on currently with that. So if you want more information about that, you can, you can grab a copy of the slide deck and click on those links. But again, um, Sorry, Stella, yeah, can you hear me? AI okay, systems. sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just, no, I, it's from me. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there's um, ethical concerns with sort of like how these exam proctoring systems are being used today. Um, another example I, I kind of wanted to talk about as well was sort of these A level exam results um, from the United Kingdom this past summer. Um, so here are some of the headlines associated with it. Um, you know, nearly 40% of A-level result predictions to be downgraded in England. The UK exam debacle reminds us that algorithms can't fix broken systems. Um, A-level downgrades hit pupils from disadvantaged areas the hardest. And maybe a, a contrasting headline, don't blame AI for the British A-level test scandal. So there's a whole slew of conversations going around what happened with the A-level results. And I'll dive into that a little bit more. So really what, what happened here? So really COVID-19 impacted UK students who were sort of in their last year going into university. Uh, they couldn't take their final exams, but and these are, I guess, uh, high school kids couldn't take their final exams, but governments really wanted the results for university admissions decisions. So, you know, very critical steps or junctures in these students' lives. The Office of Qualifications, Ofqual, decided to use a machine, lear machine learning algorithm to predict A-level exam results. Um, and, and this is, I think, where it come, becomes interesting, and standardized grade inflation. So there's this concept of certain schools, certain teachers, um, perhaps, you know, increasing grades for students a little bit above uh, what would be considered, I guess, normal relative to other teachers in schools uh, in the in the United Kingdom. So, how could we potentially standardize as well? So, not only are they trying to predict, you know, exam results, but they're also trying to standardize them as well. So, that's I think where they got into a little bit of trouble. Um, and then the end result of what actually initially happened was approximately 40% of students had their A level exam scores reduced uh, versus what a teacher would have given them. So they also had teachers writing out what they would would have given the students in terms of grade or predicted what they uh, what the students have received on the exam. And then um, the AI algorithm actually reduced approximately those scores for 40% of the students. Okay, so maybe if we, we look back at sort of the components of our AI system and uh, plug in sort of this A-level example, what does that kind of look like? So the main, components, the main data sets um, that we're talking about here are uh, schools past academic performance. So sort of in that first box, um, the students past academic performance. So not just the individual students, but the students uh, past all the students um, at that grade level at the school, um, their past performance as well, sort of how they ranked. Um, and then you also have a third kind of component for teacher grade and rank predictions. Um, so that, that information, that, that data um, is then fed into a, a machine, lear machine learning algorithm. Um, and then that would be used to then predict standardized student exam grades. Now it sounds relatively simple, but then you realize as well, there are some nuances to this. So in terms of when they used the machine learning algorithm and how they used it really varied. So one of the things they did was um, it varied depending on class sizes. So if you were in a, a class with less than five people, you know, they would completely just use the teacher kind of grade and rank predictions. Um, if you were in a class size of five to 15 people, they would actually use a mix. So they use a mix of the machine learning predicted exam grade and also the teacher predicted exam grade. 
And then if you're in a class size of 15 and above, which is um, something you typically see in public schools, it would just use the machine learning predicted exam grade. So that's, um, that's kind of where they got into a bit of trouble as well. So class sizes had a, had a big impact on the, uh, the predicted standard student exam grades. So if you wanted to take a deeper dive into this, um, I provided some links in here, but this is an example of how um, students typically achieve, the, the grade students typically achieve on their A-level exams at a school um, historically. So this is one example of an input they would use uh, for the exam, uh, for the exam prediction scores. Um, so yeah, I provided a couple of links that kind of dive into this a bit deeper, um, but basically, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the class size issue. Um, so if you were in a class with five to 15 people, typically speaking, that would more or less come from uh, a private school or those in uh, those who lived in areas with the higher socioeconomic um, sort of grounding. So students in lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, with the higher class size were more likely to have their grades decreased. Uh, because they're using just purely the algorithm in this case to predict their exam grades. And they're also because they're trying to standardize those exam grades. Um, while those in wealthier areas were less likely to be increased um, because, uh, or less likely to be decreased, sorry, um, because they were mix using a mix of the predicted and also the, the, the teacher grade. So I think in some cases they would actually end up using the teacher grade um, if it was higher than the predicted grade kind of thing. Um, as well, a higher proportion of students from independent or private schools received top grades, so A star, and A increases compared with those at comprehensive public schools. Um, and so one of the main takeaways was that the inclusion of past school performance and class size data uh, benefited students from private schools. So, you know, it wasn't that, it wasn't necessarily that they had bad intentions in, in doing what they did, um, but the fact that they started to introduce additional factors um, and depending on the data sets they used as well, they encoded biases that tended to favor or benefited students from private schools. Um, like I was saying, aftermath, it worked as intended, but seemed to unfairly publish, unfairly punish students of lower socioeconomic status. Uh, there was quite a few protests about the fairness of the results. So students uh, definitely pushed back on these results. Um, and you can see examples in social media where you can see students who wanted to get into medical school, for example, they were, uh, or thought they were gonna get into medical school, ended up not getting into it because of some of the results. Um, and the A-level results, they basically decided that have been changed to the higher for everyone uh, change the higher of the teachers or the algorithms prediction. So to try to be more fair in the end, that's what they ended up doing. Um, and also another sort of side note, but also related um, was that uh, in the European Union, they have the uh, the data protection policy framework, the GDPR, and that actually places uh, strict restrictions on organizations making solely automated decisions um, that have an effect on individuals. So that the GDPR law requires that processing to be fair, even when decisions are not automated. So it's interesting to see that, you know, they already have a framework in place to help, um, you know, keep these decisions from being completely automated. Um, and so there are some protections in place for individuals uh, to protect, your, protect themselves against uh, algorithms. And in combination with, you know, out public outcry, you can actually make quite a difference. So you don't necessarily have to accept results, like sort of what Kathy O'Neill was saying, you need to kind of push back and sort of um, push back against the results of these algorithms. Um, have I heard of instances, there's a question here about hearing instances like this happening in other countries? Um, not specifically with respect to exam grades. Um, I, I would say there are some examples, like if you've read Kathy O'Neill's book um, with respect to like K to 12 teachers, for example, um, they do use sort of like ranking systems on teachers. So there's evaluation systems on teachers that have sort of a, an AI algorithm or a machine learning algorithm behind the scenes that help you know decide on whether or not teachers should be uh, 
hired or like you know given sort of advancements and stuff like that. So there are examples of that, but I don't know about students directly being impacted by um, AI algorithms. Um, and I guess uh, generally speaking, you know, what's causing the majority of these AI problems that we hear about. So a lot of it has to do with the data itself. So there's, like I was saying, there's three main components. There's the data, the machine lear learning algorithm and the prediction. Um, the data makes up a huge component of this. So like the machine learning algorithm is in itself neutral. Um, but once you feed it data that is biased, it's gonna pick up on those biases and you can't, or it's very hard to, to determine what biases um, are existing in your training data sets uh, without actually going through the process of trying to you know, predict something and seeing what the results are. So it requires a lot of um, work to actually figure out that there are biases in your training data sets as well. Um, and the most cases for bias, we're talking about data being unrepresentative um, or and or it reflects existing prejudices that you know we may not even be aware like we may not consciously think of but are actually encoded in in the images or the texts that are included as uh, part of the data that's being fed into these algorithms and uh, and the resulting predictions so there's a lot of work being done to to look at those uh, the data sets itself and definitely like that that gender shades example is a great example of this um, but there's also an interesting example where one of the first, uh, I guess, uh, first data sets used for image classification, like when we think of image classification, it all started with like, you know, identifying whether it's a dog or not type of thing or a cat or not, or a cat or a dog or something like that. And so one of the, the first image training sets uh, that everyone who's done data science or machine learning has probably tried out at some point, uh, it's called ImageNet, uh, and that recently was found to be uh, quite biased, even though everyone, to, everyone has come across this data set at some point. Um, everyone in the field has come across this data set at some point. And so it's really interesting to kind of go back and, and realize that even though we're, we've been aware of these problems, uh, we've still used some of these data sets without even really uh, understanding that there's a problem with it. Um, there's also the the concept of, you know, framing the problem, like what do you want the AI to achieve? So in the case of the A-level exams, you know, predicting students' grades is is probably quite a fair thing to do with the, AI, with the AI algorithm, or could be argued to be a fair thing to do, but also standardizing the student grades um, across schools, across teachers, things like that. Like that's, that's where you get into a little bit of trouble, I think, when you start to combine sort of your your, what you want out of the AI algorithm. So really you have to frame the problem um, with a very sharp lens, I would say. And so the AI's decisions are made for, often made for various business reasons or other, other than fairness or discrimination. So we really, when you ask questions uh, for the, of the AI, um, you have, they have to be really sharp questions. Um, and other AI problems, just generally speaking, uh, transparency and how um, the AI is applied. So uh, for like how it's applied, for example, like um, you don't necessarily want a completely automated decision coming from AI. You want to have it sort of augment a human decision or provide sort of like an AI, uh, you know, driven or, you know, instead of a data driven decision, maybe it's like an AI driven decision or something, but it's still the human in the end that has to decide whether or not um, there's a problem and whether or not to use the AI's prediction. So I think it's important to have like the human in the loop concept uh, to be at the front of the mind and actually like use the AI to help um, augment sort of the human's decisions. Um, okay, I guess one thing we should all talk about as well is the potential of data science and artificial intelligence. So AI algorithms and their applications are, are really ubiquitous these days and have the potential to improve our lives. So like they're just, they're really everywhere um, now, whenever we interact with technology, um, I think you, there's also the concept of actually being able to use this in the classroom yourself as well. So locally, so like in your classroom, for example, grading and assessments uh, can likely be made quite a bit more efficient through automation and use of algorithms. Uh, one example we like to talk about is we've run student hackathons. So at the Callista Project, we've run student hackathons before, and it's relatively straightforward to 
re review like a handful of submissions. Um, but for example, if you had something where you had to review hundreds of submissions, you would probably like some way to automate that and make it a little bit easier than having to, to go through each and every one because it would take a long time um, number one and it would yeah it would it would just take a lot of effort for you to do that so if you're an individual teacher for example it might be like it might be impossible for you to get through all these things so th there's are ways to to make your lives a little bit easier with ai and data science um, another example from the curriculum in alberta is career and life management uh, in that sort of um, part of the alberta curriculum it, one of the things they they ask you to do is is ask the students to do is actually write a resume. And the teacher is supposed to look at that resume and provide feedback on that resume. And uh, even providing feedback on a, for a class of 30 on their resumes, you can imagine being quite difficult. Now, you, if you imagine a class of 100 or 200 or 300, like it becomes quite overwhelming. And so it's quite difficult. And there's probably consist some consistencies that you can automate and provide feedback on. And I guess another aspect of that as well is when you actually get out into the workforce these days, when you're submitting your resumes as well, um, you're oftentimes going to be submitting to uh, a system that a company uses that probably has AI incorporated in it, which will go through a checklist of things that it's looking for. And if you're not, if you don't necessarily have that, um, thing in your resume that it's looking for, or you wrote it in a funny way um, that the AI doesn't recognize, you might get filtered out as a potential candidate for a job uh, without even realizing it, even though you're, you're, you think you're fully qualified for it. So um, there's some concept of being familiar with also interacting with the, the uh, AI systems as well that we wanna be able to teach our students. Um, and as well, I think what's also interesting about data science and artificial intelligence is uh, the open source technology uh, behind a lot of the AI and data, data science tools are actually available to the public and are actually made available to the public uh, through research, um, through just individual and group efforts to make these tools available to people. So a lot of those tools that companies are using are actually based off of open source or public technology and they've you know, they've taken that in-house, like in these big companies and turned it into their, uh, to their intellectual property. So it's, it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of, I guess, origins, roots of this um, in sort of the public sector as well through open source technologies. Uh, so, you know, what can we do? So how can we sort of improve our trust in these AI and, and data science algorithms. So what concrete steps can we, we take to improve our trust in the algorithms that run our lives? So really, I think uh, taking part and getting involved and getting your hands dirty with with these these tools and techniques. So you can talk to data scientists, AI researchers. Um, there's different meetup groups. You can try out some of the tools and techniques. Like there's lots of tools and techniques out there that you can just try and they're open, available to the public. Uh, they're freely available. Um, it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, there's different social meetup groups around data science and AI. So like in Calgary, there's you know quite a few of these groups. And, and similarly throughout the world, there's um, different cities have large uh, social meetup groups. And it's just a nice place to have a conversation about data. Um, you can also directly participate in the data hackathon. Um, these social meetup groups will oftentimes organize data hackathons and you don't necessarily have to have technical skills to participate. Um, you just need to be you know, keen on participating and getting involved. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, you can get more comfortable with these technologies and concepts um, by participating in it. Um, so we have run student hackathons, for example. We have other groups that we've worked with, like STEM Fellowship and uh, Let's Make It Count out of the US. Um, so there's a lot of, like, opportunities to, to get involved and actually and participate. Um, what you can do directly in the classroom if you're a teacher, you can introduce computational thinking and data science concepts and skills. Um, we have the Callisto program has a bunch of resources. So I've listed some out here. So we have like getting started materials, uh, curriculum modules, uh, lesson plans, and um, we have an online, we have a couple online courses as well that are free for teachers or, uh, to use. And we, we kind of target grades five to 12 teachers. Um, so feel free to use those or share those with any of your colleagues. Um, you can also do different activities that don't necessarily um, require sort of a, a 
a deep dive into the technical side of things. So there's we have a data visualization of the week activity. Um, there's also different curriculum made, uh, for example, by MIT and the AI ethics education curriculum, which I really think is fantastic. And I've provided a link there as well. Um, a little bit of background about some of the, the tools that we use at the Callisto Project. So we use uh, the Jupyter ecosystem. So a Jupyter notebook um, is, is really what we use to, to showcase some of these data science uh, techniques and concepts. Um, and it's an online document that includes both text and live Python code um, that you can run. And uh, these documents, you know, they run on our service that we've made available for students and teachers. Um, but you can also run them on commercial services as well, such as Google and IBM and all those things. Um, so yeah, we have all that stuff available through our cluster.ca website. Um, yeah, and just maybe another comment about what the data science community is doing. So the data science community is, it recognizes a lot of this, the problems and ethics associated with, you know, AI and data science as well. So the associate Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM. Um, they have a quote saying that five years from now, all students majoring in computing will have an experience using computing to better the world. So this um, almost like data for good concept or AI for good concept. Um, UC Berkeley now has this human context and ethics curriculum as well. So if you're an undergrad there, you can, you can, you can get involved with that. Um, and uh, for algorithms themselves, there's been a big, huge push around interpretability. So oftentimes we can we look at these algorithms as kind of like black boxes, um, where we throw some data in there, we get a prediction. Um, but like I was, I was always, as I was saying, to understand what biases are actually built into the algorithms, we need to be able to really interpret and understand how these algorithms are working. So there's been a huge effort by big companies um, like Facebook and Microsoft, Facebook, Microsoft, and uh, Google, and all those things, all those big companies around interpreting um, machine learning. So interpret ML, fair learn, open differential privacy. So these are all sort of machine learning algorithms that are actually quite interpretable, interpretable and have tools built in to, to allow you to interpret what's going on. So that's really exciting. There's also algorithms and, and concepts like human in the loop where before you make your prediction or before a prediction is implemented, you, you wanna have a human or a set of humans there to really verify what's going on. Um, you don't want everything to be sort of automated. Um, there's also the concept of auditing these algorithms. So before you release something into well, you wanna have a third party come in and audit them to make sure that what's going on is fair. And again, constant, and again, like monitoring of what these uh, algorithms are doing is, is really, really important. Uh, there's also a project called OpenDS for All, and it has a lot of interesting resources for people to, to take a look at. And um, it's, it's Creative Commons license as well, I believe. So you can uh, reuse and remix up those contents as well. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to wrap up. I think I'm almost at the end of my time now. So um, I have a feedback form. Feel free to fill that out. I have a link here. I'll just slide it into the uh, chat. Um, feel free to, to let me know how I did today. Um, and if you want more information about uh, the project I'm involved in, Callisto, you can email us at contact at callisto.ca or you can check out our website. And that's just some of the information on how to contact us. So I think I'll stop there. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Byron, thank you so much for this. Uh, we will open this up to any questions that folks may have in the room. Um, feel free to drop them in the chat or turn your microphone on and ask him directly. Um, this is all incredibly fascinating. Um, I was a part of the public interest technology team at New America, which is a civic and think tank, civic enterprise and think tank in the US. Um, and it, it started with the idea of getting people interested in technology, but not to be uh, working at Microsoft and Google, <laughs> but to be to be public servants and to work in government and and bring their technical skill set in. And so it's it's a very new field and um, they're continuing in their second year as far as the university network where they're providing grants to universities here in the US um, to actually build programs. 
and that involves the curriculum. So it has to be multidisciplinary, like you were showing that diagram, the Venn diagram of how it is very multidisciplinary and bringing the different colleges together um, can be incredibly challenging. And so um, it's just really interesting. I dropped the link to this year's um, grantees. Um, there's a YouTube video that kind of introduces the folks that'll be doing things this year. And it includes a lot of your Ivy League schools here in the US, but it also includes um, like Miami-Dade College um, because they have a large you know, population and they wanna get folks interested in this. So um, this is all really, really interesting and very helpful. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, there's it, it is a pretty new and even like the concept of data science and K to 12 is pretty new. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways, but what's really cool is like, like I was saying, a lot of this comes from like the open source side of the technology fields and all of it is actually available um, for you to poke around with and play around with uh, for free uh, with your computer. So like, um, it's really interesting how it's kind of evolved and how uh, big companies are taking this, but now they're starting to recognize that they need to, to also understand what's going on with these algorithms and also give back to the community as well. So they're making a lot of effort to, uh, a lot of efforts in these areas as well. Byron, would you mind dropping the link to your slides in one more time, just because we had folks join after and they won't have access to that? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And Are there any other slide. questions or comments for Byron? All right, everyone give Byron a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> we will start to transition to our next presenter now. Connie, I believe you're